most likely they would have taken refuge, you know, or the layman vows. These are the type of people that, you know, would have had to have um, from the, they would have to have. Um, Who? Well, what people? In, in your community that you would consider a spiritual teacher? Mostly, I would say, like at this center, you would probably just have, um, you know, like spiritual companions. So sort of like we're all practicing together, trying to learn together. I bring a certain knowledge just because of my studies and because of my vows. You know, living in the vows certainly brings a certain experience. There's no question about that. Um, I mean, it isn't automatic, but it's just it's it's if you keep your vows, you're you're definitely practicing. So. Um, and if they wanted to be a teacher, they would have to get. Um, no, they you don't have, have to ask. No, have if you want, if, if no, 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 that's if you're conferring like refuge vows, lay vows. That you need permission from one of the oh, okay. If you've got a student-teacher relationship with someone, you know that's personal. You know, I would, but I, you know, I really don't recommend going too quickly. They, I mean, they say you should really investigate your teacher for 12 years before deciding. Because you don't want to go with your gut here. You may have an affinity for someone because you were lovers in the last life. Yeah. Right. You know, I mean, that's just not what you're looking for here. You know, so you can't just go by, oh, I always feel better when I'm in their company. <laughs> that's just not enough. Because actually, most of the time when you're in the company of your teacher, you don't feel better. You're going, oh. Challenge. Yeah. I see my pride. Yes, there it is. <laughs> <laughs> That's, you know, oh, I see my anger. So, um, when you were saying six days a week, um, 11 months a year, you were referring to monks or? People in their Geshe studies. That's how they study in the, in the, in the monastery. Uh -huh. But they're not necessarily. Um, they're studying the teachings. Yeah. They're scholars. I, academic. It's an academic pursuit. It can be just an academic pursuit. That's what we don't know. It's definitely an academic pursuit. But it doesn't mean for everybody who's studying that's all it is. Because great teachers don't come from that. Or great they, teachers are experiencing the teachings. You they can don't come from the academic. No, they would have the academic as well. You need the knowledge. But, you know, it's, it's, it's just that great teachers um, don't just study the teachings. They don't get it from just studying the They practice the teachings. They put them, they implement them. They don't just know the words. They don't just memorize the text. They go within themselves and really investigate their own minds. But they, that can't be Testing. engineered from, from the monastery no. environment. It's, because, no, it's an inner process. So it's a choice. You know, some people really are great students, and they go, you know, and they're really good students, but they have not internalized the teachings. So when you're looking for a teacher, in this sense, a guru, you're looking for someone that seems to have the qualities that come from someone who works with the teachings, not just knows them. So what do you think about... Um Courses like um, Columbia University that we're doing in the West, like where Thurman's teaching Buddhism, is there? We need the knowledge. No harm in the knowledge at all. So do you think that there's the same potential for teachers to come out of that system? I don't know. I mean, I think there's an advantage. Like, I'm really kind of glad to have taken vows as an adult. I'm glad to have had relationships. I'm glad to have had sex. You know, I'm glad I've had those experiences in this life. I think it's enriched my, my life as a nun to have that knowledge. You know. You know, so I do think that's, you know, I do think that's a, a something Westerners bring to the um, to the tradition. You know, so um, is it necessary? No. You know, it's just like, I have proof in this life how many mistakes you can make, you know? 
You know, if someone's born to live, grow up in a monastery, they may have more merit than I do. <laughs> there may be a reason why they landed there. You know, so I mean, it's it's it really is a dependent arising. It's just that it's, um, and if you've done lots of uh, studies and practice in previous lives, those conditions can write, you know, it can be enough for you. But, but if that's all you have access to in this life, then you go for it. That, that would be the foolishness, is wasting any opportunity. I can't believe I lived in North Carolina and didn't know about Jeffrey Hopkins and his courses at UVA. You know. I had friends taking <laughs> so, No merit. So, but it's just, it's, um, I do think, well, I don't know, I mean, it so it just depends. Now, to think that just so that somebody was born in the West doesn't mean they weren't a Tibetan, you know, monastic in their previous life is foolish. You know, since 1959, why would you be reborn in Tibet? You know, of course there are teachers being born in the West, you know, because it's better, you know, better conditions. You know, being born in Sikkim in Nepal because they're, you know, they're free countries. You know, they can go to the monasteries and practice their religious preference, which isn't true in, in Tibet any longer. I mean, you can practice, but it's really controlled. It's not like it, I mean, it's no comparison. So, and it goes up and down. Sometimes they can practice, sometimes they're safe, and sometimes they're not. Like in Nepal right now, they're, they're pushing them out with the Tibetans. Yeah. It comes and goes. They have obstacles. Everybody knows. I mean, this is samsara. <laughs> That's what it's going to be. So what I want to convey here is that when you're talking about a guru, your lama, you know, you're talking about this, this kind of situation where when you think of this person, you really are uplifted. You know, you have you you know you have this trust in them, this faith in them, this confidence in them, and this experience with them that just you know that inspires you. So it's it's this is a very special relationship doesn't mean you don't have many really, you know, important teachers. It's like, who was it? Was it a teacher that said, out of all his um, teachers, Sir Langpo was, you know, he's the one who, you know, really inspired Bodhicitta in him. That's who he valued the most, even though they were, they had different um, views of emptiness. So they didn't, you know, so they, you know, so, um, so it's that, you know, this moving the heart is really important. You know, this, that, that kind of quality. Um, you can't fake that. No, and you don't want to mistake it. So you want it based on something more than just, you know, some sort of, you know, instant recognition, although that can be valid. Now you're dripping on the people. So, um, And, well, I can't because uh, I'm connected. So the guru is that person or situation that shows us the reality of our minds. Every event, every ordinary person in this sense can be our teacher. So again, this goes back to what we were studying last time, you know, transforming problems, is this idea that every condition, every person we meet, every, every situation can actually be a condition that helps us ripen our path towards enlightenment. You know, so that's another use of this term. So it's not about whether someone is a geshe or whether someone is uh, ordained or someone is a lay person. You know, a lot of it is this part of the relationship. Like you were talking about, Francesca, this idea of someone that you have sort of this, you know, um, that, you know, that inspires you in this dharmic way. Um, and often, I mean, I think the sponsorship, because I, I think often about 12-step um, programs because they, they really relate well to Buddhism. I mean, it's, I, you know, it's, it's, but this, you know, so having a sponsor, 
you know, if somebody helps helps you, it's their your reality check, you know, like, you know, are you kidding yourself? Are you lying to yourself again? Are you still on the path, you know? And, and what do you, and it supports you. It doesn't disown you or something because you've fallen off the path. It's, it's just, it's just sort of like helping you stay on the right track, you know, and being able to tell you when you're not. So, you know, that's an important relationship in our Dharma conversations with each other. You know, being able, unlike our ordinary friends and friendships that often tell us what we want to hear, you know, it's like, you know, trying to develop those friendships where you want to be able to say, you know, oh, I really lost it yesterday, you know, blah, blah, and not have them go, oh, it's okay, dear. That's no help at all. If you're trying to transform your mind, you don't need these little pats on the back going, oh, that's all right, you didn't kill anybody. Yeah. That's not helping you. You know, you need the kind of relationships that will kind of say, oh, well, so what, what do you want? Let's think about that. How could you handle that differently? Or, you know, or you want to do purification practice together. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is their, this is in the, tea, the analogy of the tea. The sun can be very hot, but just the sun alone, shining on a pile of kindling, isn't enough to make that kindling burst into flames. However, if you have a magnifying glass that focuses all that solar energy onto the kindling, then it can catch fire. The kindling is our Buddha nature. This is our potential. We have the potential to become Buddhas. The sun is, the, is all the enlightened energy of those already enlightened shining down on us. The magnifying glass is the spiritual friend, the mentor, the guru, the lama, who through unmistaking teachings focuses this energy so the student can receive it. So this is, you know, the person that, you know, that you have this relationship with that you, you know, will tell the truth, will describe what's really going on with you, and, and, and they will offer advice about the difference between, like, the Dharma companion and the, you know, the, this relationship. This is, you know, you don't teach your teacher. They teach you. It's not that they're not learning from you, but it's not your job to teach the teacher. This is a relationship of hierarchy where the teacher is your mentor. You, know, you need to use your inner wisdom to judge whether you, you know, I mean, it's not like you just accept everything that they say, but it's sort of like the therapist appointment. You don't know a whole lot about the therapist and what their practice is like. They too have a teacher. This is not like a Dharma companion. This is someone who you're putting your trust in to help guide you, that, who's ahead of you on the path, or their understanding, or however you want to phrase it. This is not your buddy, but they're more valuable to your life than a buddy. And they have your best interest at heart. But they're not trying to be your buddy. They're not going to just try to tell you what you want to hear or, you know. But they do, you know, you know, so you'll see <laughs> sometimes, you know, like if you live in a monastery, you're going to see a lot of um, students getting, you know, yelled at by their teachers. Partly because it's the Tibetan culture. <laughs> We wouldn't stand today. We'd go. This is abuse. <laughs> I would. I wouldn't be able to take it at all. <laughs> Total whim. Uh, so, um, so the karma connection developed in life after life between teacher and student is created because of our trust in our teacher, because of our openness with our teacher, because of our respect for our teacher, and because of our awe of the teacher. Yes? As a student, um, the first vow we take, is that, would that be refuge? Yeah, and they really, it's actually sort of not vows. There's some commitments with, they were called, they call them like vows, but, but it's, the first thing you take is refuge, you know, 
And you don't actually need someone to take refuge in. So if you read that section in the liberation of the palm of your hand, um, it describes how you can, you know, because it's from the heart. It's that you're, you know, you're taking refuge, you know. So when you take it from a, in a ceremony, it's just more of a, you know, you're establishing a relationship with the person who confers it. That's part of it. And also you, you take on these commitments, you know, that they talk about. But it's, you know, but it really starts in the heart. You know, it's like, you know, that's where it starts. So if you don't have the opportunity to take refuge, um, or not ready to take refuge with a particular person, you can, you know, start, and this is where to start, is, you know, is put it into play and from your heart. And that person that you take refuge from, what level of they become a, uh, what they call as a sutra um, teacher. You establish this relationship as, uh, on the sutra level. It's not tantra, but it's not tantra. So, you know, but you do have a sort of student teacher relationship. Can I understand them? There's no progress on the spiritual path if we don't have a, a spiritual friend or guru or teacher. I think if you don't have refuge, there would be none. And they certainly do teach that you need a teacher, eventually you need a teacher. There's no question about that. Now whether you need a living teacher standing in front of you is not necessarily the case. I mean, we've seen that with people who, you know, really, His Holiness is their teacher. And they just, you know, they try to put into words all the things that they understand, you know, from his teachings. Um, it's ideal to have someone that you can take direct teachings from. There's no question about that. But it's just not always going to happen in this life. No. And the way to make it happen is to have respect for the Dharma, respect for the teachings. It's where you learn to really try to put into practice what they say about refuge commitments. That was a different course. We took that a couple of modules ago, <laughs> just so I don't try to teach the whole thing in one night. But you know, so you, you try to implement those things. Um, so these little things, like when I go around and the students have been around a while, and I go, don't put your phone on top of a prayer book. Because <laughs> that's called abandoning the Dharma. So when, you, when, you, you know, when you're looking, it's disrespecting the Dharma to, to put mundane things on top of uh, the Dharma. You know, so if you've taken refuge, you want to become familiar with those kinds of suggestions, you know, so that because it's a mindfulness practice, because what we want to start seeing, you know how, you know, if you won, you know, a million dollar lottery, how would you treat that ticket? Would you take any chances for it to get wet or get lost or get folded or get smooched so you couldn't read the number? Not on your life. Well, this is way more valuable than that. Yeah. So, like, if you're having a problem with mice, you know, like you have something come up and you're really, you know, you're trying to figure out how to, you know, navigate your situation, um, in a, you know, wisely, you know, with compassion, with, you know, with generosity, with all the things that you're being taught in with the Dharma, um, but you, you feel confused, you know, and, you're, and you need a little bit of guidance. Who, um, if you don't have a teacher, you... You come to me. Yeah, absolutely. You come to the person that has the most knowledge of the people you know. That's all you can do, you know, and you're welcome to. You're welcome to send me emails. All of y'all will have my email address after tonight. I mean, it's, you know, I'm really accessible, and that's the right thing to do. You know, it's just that it doesn't mean you're taking them on as your teacher, but, you know, you always go to the, you know, the person that, you know, has more knowledge than you do, and that, you know, that you feel confidence in. You know? So if you don't have any, if you are at a place and you don't have any confidence in anyone, don't ask anybody. You know? Right. <laughs> just don't. I mean, that's, you know, we just need to accept that. That's... You, know, you always want to look in your own mind and kind of go, why do I not trust anybody? <laughs> See if there's maybe it comes from your side. <laughs> so, but at the same time, you know, 
and we'll get to it, maybe, if <laughs> it's apparently not to, oh gosh, it's 10, it's 9, not tonight. But you know, remember, the, the Buddha said, you don't take my word for it. And so also with the teacher, if the teacher gives you advice that you don't think fits the teachings, you very politely decline. You just don't do it. It's your responsibility not to do it, not the teacher's. It's, that's, this, it's a two-way thing, you know. So if we, you know, we didn't have the merit, we might have, you all know, are probably all enlightened already, just waiting for me to get with the program. <laughs> but it's, you know, if you're not in the presence of someone like Shakyamuni Buddha, if you don't have the merit to be right there with a, um, a, the emanation of a Buddha in a form that we actually can see as ordinary being, you know, then our teachers, the, our access to that kind of being is obscured. You know, so we can just do, we have to deal, you know, we have to go with what's available. And the Buddha said, the Shakyamuni Buddha said at, at the time of uh, you know, the, his death, it was that he would send us teachers. You know, so, you know, this is, uh, and so the Tibetans take this at its literal meaning. But it's up to us to figure out who is someone that's appropriate to put our trust in. So it's, it's, that's our responsibility and takes time. But, uh, but yeah, so you just go, you know, you know, I would say that um, we all know we have friends that we rely on more than others in terms of advice. You know, we have friends that maybe we, you know, always enjoy having dinner with, with our, you know, as couples and all that kind of stuff because, you know, everybody gets along and then, but you might not ever go to them for advice, you know, and then you have others, you know, we want to develop that inner wisdom about things like that. And then we also have to just face facts and just know that um, as far as, you know, you know, scholarly knowledge, you know, there, there is a difference in, in, you know, so if you're trying to figure out what is the, the, <laughs> the rule, <laughs> there's no rules, but, you know, if there were rules, but, you know, if you're trying to find out what the Buddha said, you know, scholars are really good for that. <laughs> so, that's an advantage. Hence, Alex Burson's website. <laughs> anyway. Um, but, and there are. You know, if you want, if you're really interested in a particular topic, you know, you can go to studybuddhism.com for Alex Burns and stuff. His stuff is really academic. His language, use of language is just like that. But, and then if you want, you know, Lama Yichi Wisdom Archive is just a wonderful website with Lama Sopa's, Rinpoche's teachings and Lama Yeshi's teachings and Geshe Sopa's teachings. You know, it's a, you know, you just do the search engine, you'll land on somewhere. It's wonderful to read. Uh, Tupton Children's website um, is, you know, she's a student of Lama Zopa Rinpoche. It's not an FPMT center, but, you know, but, you know, she's a student of Lama Zopa Rinpoche. She is a wonderful site, you know. So, you, and you, everybody has a different, what connects with them, you know, what you're going to, you know, I didn't read Alex Burson for years. I just couldn't stand it. I said, oh, oh my God, can you make the language any more hard to understand? And, you know, of course, it was my fault. I didn't understand the material well enough to understand this website. So there you go. That's changed, you know. But so you have, you know, and then some people really relate to Tujin Children's voice and her stuff, you know, and others don't. And, you know, so you, but you want them to have, you want to definitely check out whose website are you reading because it could, you know, you don't want to just go anywhere, especially in this day and age where we have access to everything. <coughs> so... Okay. Can we let go for tonight? Yeah. Good. It's fun though, isn't it? Mm -hmm. You know, in a kind of weird way. <laughs> so, um, so if you put your name down with your email address, please make, if you have terrible handwriting, make, check the list and make sure you wrote it, because I type them in, and if I can't read your handwriting, it, it, I get that bounce thing. There's always one, there's always at least one, but I, I get that little thing like, sorry, that doesn't exist. And I go, oh, maybe they really didn't want to, you know, it's like giving the wrong phone number to a guy who asked me for it in the bar. You know, like, yeah, well, whatever. 
So <laughs> that's okay too, but you don't have to sign the list. <laughs> Feel free, because I worry when I can't get it through. Um, so this class doesn't have as many teachings <laughs> that, that are just included in the PDF, and it's because of the book. <laughs> that I gave Anthony called Heart of the Path. It's probably one of the library, if anybody. This is Lama Zo. It's finally teaching, you know, an edited um, book of all of Lama Zo Rinpoche's teachings on Guru Devotion. He, and he talks about Guru Devotion as much as he talks about emptiness. And he talks about emptiness all the time. So, um, so it's a really special book. You know, if, if Guru Devotion is just sort of like, sorry, not going there, don't read it because you might someday want to go there. It's a beautiful book. So you don't want to go there when you're already at this kind of skeptical state, you know, wait a while. Um, you know, read the Buddha's life story, inspiration instead. But um, anyway, so next week, Emily Sue will be here. She's a graduate of the master's program. Um, and a very organized teacher. I've always relied on her charts. She made chart, a lot of charts for the basic program and the master's program, and I've always downloaded them and used them. So, um, and she's lovely. So it's, and she's going to speak to what if something goes wrong with the relationship with the guru? You know, and, you, and they either do something that you don't understand or whatever. And so I thought it would be good to have a layperson talk about that. Um, and then I will also talk to that, but I just thought it would be a good topic for her to come to cover next week because, um, you know, we always hear there, they all, you know, you know uh, we're in samsara, so there are going to be teachers who uh, turn out to not be, have been appropriate teachers. There will also be students who misunderstand teachers. I mean, everything happens, everything, you know, we're all a condition for that. But it's really important to understand before you make a, a, you know, a strong relationship with the teacher, what it means so that you, you know, don't get caught in this feeling. You know, like when Sogo Rinpoche last year or the year before when His Holiness came out and said he was disgraced because of his inappropriate behavior. You know, can you imagine how many students he has? You know, he's been around for a while, had centers all over the place, you know, wrote living and dying, you know. He died you know, last year. Sogo Rinpoche? Yeah. So, but this causes this, this, um, this causes real difficulty for the students. It's really tragic when the students are faced with, you know, doubts, you know. So you really want to kind of have an idea, because it is okay to walk away from your teacher. It's not okay to disparage them. So if you have this relationship with someone, you just very internally just decide not to follow their teachings anymore. You don't go around screaming, yelling. That's different if they've harmed you. But it, you know, but it's just it's you know you really want to understand that the Buddha said don't take anybody's word for it. And if anybody gives you instructions you don't feel fits the Dharma, you do you just decline. You know, so it's just it's and it's really important um, to understand that through. Because, you know, the Tibetans use all this honorific language and all this glory and da 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 da, you know, and so it can it can feel like, oh, you know. <laughs> well, that's their culture. That's the culture part. You know. But the, um, you know, so anyway, but, but so I've, I've, that's what I've asked her, that's the section of the teachings on this, on this module I've asked her to teach on, because I think it's really important and I think it's helpful to have more than one point of view, you know. Um, so, okay. So you're not going to be here? Not next week. No, okay. So she's I'm out of town. So, yeah. So she's going to teach on Tuesday and Thursday and Sunday. You know, so I'll be here this Sunday. But I'll be gone for a week, so. Uh, Are you going on vacation? <laughs> I am going to Raleigh. So, yeah. you could call it a, a, a vacation, but so far it doesn't look like it. I have a meeting about the Light of the Path Retreat on Monday. I have a meeting with Geshe Gellick with the other nuns on Tuesday. <laughs> I'm going, okay. <laughs> so, but that's all right. It's all good. 
So anyway, all right. Thank so you. now, really, to take a moment to rejoice that you spent, you know, a couple of hours of your life, and you know, working on something like this. Wouldn't it be wonderful if you know everybody spent time like this every day, not two hours necessarily. <laughs> I mean, you know, because this is how we work on our minds, and this is, um, and this is where all our potential is. So that's our heart, our mind. It's wonderful. So really, feel good about that. And really make the wish that it not just benefits yourself, but it creates the cause for you know other sentient beings. You know that you'll be able to benefit other sentient beings, and someday there'll be no suffering sentient beings in samsara. And that would be just too wonderful. So, so make a positive intention for whatever you're going to do next. You know, and enjoy the rest of this 24 hours. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.